So what I, I want to set the stage. Uh, the other day, I was out the front of my house, and we sort of live near the top of a hill. And I was sitting there looking up, uh, up the hill, and there's a park just across the way. And this van came around the corner, and I recognised it was a, a, a white Toyota Hiace van. And I grabbed like my had my attention because I drive one of these for work, and I actually love big vans. And I don't know what it is, and everyone gives, I love it. And then I saw it around the corner. I was like, oh, that's a good van. Yeah, nice Toyota Hiace. It's a newer one than mine. And I was just, and, you know, and then I saw the guy in it was wearing a high vis shirt. And I was like, oh, that's a delivery truck. I don't bloody wonder if it's for me. Then it rounds the corner and then comes past me and then keeps going. I'm not going to lie. I was a little disappointed. I was a little disappointed. Goes about three or four houses down, crosses on the other side of the street, turned right. And then I had enough. I'd like, do you know why that van didn't stop at my house? I haven't ordered anything. <laughs> I have no deliveries that I've purchased, that I've ordered. I have no reason to expect a delivery to my house. I don't. And that person down the road, I'm just going to have a wild guess. I'm going to say wait for it, no, that they did order something. And I just wonder how often we feel like this, right? The delivery van of life, you know, just the different things. It might be that partner you thought you wanted, that guy at work is really hot and nice and you sort of think he might be a bit of a Christian. You can get him over the line easily enough. And then he starts going out with someone else. Or that position at work that you thought was yours and you just definitely deserved and it just went right past. And how often, I wonder, do we see these vans go past and we get upset? Like, God, Jacob was teaching us about the blessing. He said, we're blessed with the blessing of Abraham and it unlocks all this stuff in my life and that van did not stop at my house. Where is the justice? Where is, where is your, you promised that I would be blessed and that van went straight past. I bet you that person doesn't even go to church and they had the van rock up at their house. Where is the fairness? Where is the justice? And I just have to laugh at myself. Oh, good, we have the justice back there. Excellent. Yeah, excellent. And I just, just have to laugh at myself because I genuinely was disappointed when I went past. And, and I just, but the reality is, is there's this system in life where cause and effect, things have to, have, certain things have to be done for other things to happen. Like, I'm not going to, I was just going to damage my relationship really. <laughs> I was going to say things that. I'm going to keep going. Right. Focus. Anyway, so, like, and that's us in life so often. So often that's us in life. But now, you, like, a little secret is, is that person that got that delivery, like, there's nothing that suggested that was anything miraculous from God. You know what? I bet, it was, I bet they loved it. I don't know what it was. I bet it was great. I bet they got it and they saw the box when it came and they were like, yes, this is my delivery. I've got my thing. <laughs> you, know. you know the worst deliveries I get? And I think, because I, I still get excited when there's deliveries because every now and again, every, every, every now and again, you get a random one that you didn't order, you didn't pay for, and it turns up and it is for you and it's great. It doesn't happen very often. I'll get them and they're like flyers Mel's had printed. I'm like, <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Mother's Day, <laughs> like Mother's Day outreach, invite your mum. We've got all these church, you know, I'm like, oh, you know. And, and but what I'm getting at is like, there are certain things, cause and effect, and this is how the universe works. God made it like that. He, he made it in, a, in such a way that you, born again or not born again, you get, a, you get a, a seed, you stick it in the ground, the right set of circumstances, you can pray over it or not pray over it, Because God has set certain things in play, that thing is going to grow. 
if the right set of circumstances surround it, whether you're born again Christian, whether you're, you're not a Christian, whether the thing fell randomly from another tree, landed in the right spot, and then just happened like that. Whether, you know, a bird ate it, deposited it somewhere else, and then it grew. Like, it doesn't even, it doesn't matter. Certain things are. And then what I want us to look at is the fact that we do live under the blessing. God promises us that we are set apart, that he wants the distinction between us and the world. So how do we, how do we supersede the regular sowing and reaping, the regular cause and effect? glad you asked great question great question how do we unlock the next level of supernatural provision because this is a finance series we're talking about finances we're talking about being generous and giving and being good stewards but a big part of what we actually need to understand and I know that I like to hear I like to know about is let's just be really 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 honest with ourselves I like to hear I like to know how I can be blessed more. I know people, it's like, oh, it's a bless me club. And I know it's not all about me and it's not all about blessing. But some of it is. Just saying. Some of it is. Do you know what they call this book? The Good News. Do you know what Jesus said the good, to do with the good news? To preach it to the poor. Why? To the poor. Because they are the ones that need it the most. And so what I wanted to be doing here is I just want to help us to really understand how we can move past the world system in the area of our finances when we're speaking specifically around our giving and receiving. So what um, I want us to look at here is to unlock this blessing, to unlock, it, the, the scripture says that we receive the promises by faith. Faith has very little to do with what you think inside your head. Faith has everything to do with what becomes a reality inside your head and manifests with your actions. What you do because you believe it. If you just believe it, the scripture says that faith without action is dead. Dead faith is not faith. So it's like how do we put wheels on this book to make it active and activate the blessing in our life? Jesus called it keys. He said he's got keys. Now I want to read the passage in Matthew 16. It says this, Matthew 16, 19. Jesus said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, that passage, a little bit of context. Jesus has said keys. So when he's talking about binding and loosing, we have to understand He's talking about a key. So what does that mean? Binding, he's talking about chains and a lock. Chains and a lock. What good is a key if it's rope? What good is a key if it's anything except a lock? Chains binding and a lock to unlock or to lock. So he says, I have given you the keys. And now this particular passage, most often we, in the, especially in the Pentecostal movement, the Word of Faith uh, Church, we, 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 we apply this scripture like this. In Jesus' name, I bind the Satan over there, or I loose the blessing here, or I bind the sickness there. All right. And that is not incorrect. That is actually uh, there's plenty of scriptures that show there is power in our words, that our words actually, we can release our word and they will actually do what we send them out to do. So that is a totally uh, legal, if you like, or accept, like proper application of this word. But you'll notice that Jesus didn't say key. He didn't say, I will give you the key to the kingdom. He said, I'll give you the keys, plural, of heaven to the kingdom, uh, the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And what it's talking about doing, and whatever you lock on earth will be locked in heaven. Whatever you unlock on earth will be unlocked in heaven. And now what we start to see here is that what you do on earth affects what is happening in heaven. What you lock, allow, stop on earth through your actions or words or however you do it, has a spiritual effect in heaven 
And then heaven responds to what you've done. Faith, apply, that is literally how faith works. The Bible says, like, you can have faith, like the world uses faith all the time. We have faith in the Word of God. And, and what I'm wanting us to do here is I want, we're not using the keys that the world is using because they work and a lot of them are great and a lot of them are actually in the Bible and even talks about doing it, like real basic things. Like Melissa shared last week some of the really practical stuff about being a good steward of our finances, spending less than you make. What a radical notion. Saving. What an insane idea. Not spending everything you have. What a, what a mind-blowing concept. The world does it and it works, but I can also show you scriptures in the Bible where we're taught to do that from God. So it, it, what we're looking at here is how do we go past there? How do we go past there? Because I promise you, the Bible talks constantly about those that are being blessed as having a distinction between the, uh, them and the world. It, it, it's constantly the Bible saying, I want to use you as a showpiece. To even properly understand it, just you look at Israel, it's this tiny little strip right in the Middle East. It, it, there's mountains on one side, the desert mountains, and then there's a, uh, the sea on the other side, and it connects Africa and Europe and Asia. It, you have to, it's, it's a tiny little land bridge that the whole world had to go through. Or, like you wanted to go anywhere in the world, you had to go through Jerusalem. The fact that today our media has, so, like, there's so much stuff going on around the world. But do you know what we hear about the most? Little old Jerusalem, this tiny little stretch of land that's about the width of from the beach to York, from Rockingham to Yanship. That is, that is, that's what we're talking, all of this stuff on the news is talking about the beach to York across, Yanship to Rockingham to up and down. It's, it's a tiny, and, and what God always wanted was that people would have to go through there because they would have to see that land and then they would get to know what he's like because of how he treats his kids. And that is the good news. That is the good news. Now, for us, we are invited to, to enter in and to be this expression of God. Can I tell you the way? My, I'm, I, my family, we grew up in church. When I was a teenager, I, my parents separated. I went AWOL and I came back to God at the age of 21. Thank you, Pastor Malcolm, forever in your debt. Uh, at an um, adult and teen challenge, which is a Christian drug and alcohol rehab, because I was a raging heroin addict. Do you know who else is raging heroin addicts? My older brother and my little brother and all my friends. Now, they've all come to God. How? Most of them, because they looked at my life and how good God had been to me. My older brother, he was right in it, and my little brother had already come to God and turned his life around, started applying these principles not just the ones we're talking about finances here, all the, you know, the different things. And then his, his girlfriend who, you know, he's been living with and they've got a kid and everything like that. She said, Jacob and Isaac have done it. Why can't you do it? And then he said, well, they, you, the, if I'm going to do that, the, the reason they were able to do it is because of God. He said, if I'm going to do it like they did, I'm going to have to become a Christian and stop all this. And she was at the point where she's like, I don't care what you do. <laughs> like, not this. And but, but what I'm getting at is, is, was the distinction of the blessing that God put on my life is what attracted these people to God. It wasn't me Bible bashing them, turn and burn, anything like that. It was them seeing the fruit of, God, of, of, the, of the fruit of applying the word what it did to my life. So when we're talking about blessing and when we're talking about these keys that unlock good things in our life, we're not being greedy. We're not talking about, you know, some bless me club or some prosperity gospel or anything like that. This is one key that we're focusing on at the moment. And I promise you guys, there are a lot of keys and you want them all in your life because who wants to be sick? Who wants to be broke? Who wants to be depressed? Who wants their kids to be running amok? Who wants to not have a house? Who want, There are a lot of stuff that, you know, let's be brutally honest, guys. They're things we want in our life. Amen? And God cares and he wants to get involved and he actively has things that we can put in place that will give those things, uh, that will help those things operate in the blessing.
Amen? So Jesus said, I've got these keys. In 1 Corinthians 15, 46, it says this, the spiritual did not come first, but the natural. And after that, the spiritual. And that was specifically talking about the exact context of that was Adam was made of dust on the ground, lump of dirt, God breathed. He didn't just breathe and Adam happened. Naturally, there was a lump of dirt that was shaped as a man. The natural key was turned. Heaven breathed. Man was alive. The natural heaven comes down, rises up as the miracle, the manifest miracle. The, we have to turn the key on earth. We have to. Unlocks heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be, bound, will be loosed in heaven. That's how it works. So now we're going to look at some keys to do with A lot of the time we can, and this, I, I actually I love that I've got the opportunity to preach this um, this morning because too often we confuse following direction as legalism. There is a concern amongst, especially these days, uh, about, about being too legalistic. There's a concern about being, uh, the Bible being misappropriated and used as a controlling mechanism or even just people not understanding it properly and and instead of living the freedom that god has for people they're actually uh, they're living less than where they should be because they feel the bible that, that the bible's talking about things that god is saying yes and no and don't do this and certain limitations that he wants to put on us so what what i love here is that i get to explain where some of these perceived limitations how it works so what actually the way it works is remember that jesus said i will give you the keys plural of the kingdom of heaven whatever you bind lock will be will be you have to whatever happens on earth first then the spiritual okay so now when we start to read the bible and it gives us instructions i want us to see something james chapter 1 and verse 22 says this don't merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself do what it says. Radical, radical notion. Radical. Oh, James, that's so legalistic, man. You know who James was? He was Jesus' brother. He was Jesus' brother. He was like the only guy that wasn't one of the, the 12 or the apostle Paul that like wrote in the New Testament. Oh, no, Luke. Scratch all of that. That was totally off. He was Jesus' brother, except for all the others that were the same. So don't merely listen to the word so deceive yourself. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself in the mirror goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. Saying here that if you don't, you read it and don't apply it, you're like someone with no self-awareness. You're like someone who just has no concept of what you look like to other people. No concept of how your actions affect people. Have no concept of what, what the way that you are operating and, and how it transposes to the rest of the planet. Basically, it's saying if you're reading it and not doing it, you are living in this level of unawareness that's embarrassing. And I reckon, if you're like me, you've read some stuff and been embarrassed because you're like, nah, not doing that, Jesus. Well, I can see it says it. I'm not doing it. Like, you know, some of them, like, you know, oh, the Bible says that you're supposed to have a Sabbath. Oh, the New Testament. No, we're, every day is a Sabbath now. Well, you know, God was pretty clear about it. It's like the one commandment in the 10 that we think, well, nah, we don't worry about that. The murder, kill, like, don't kill, don't commit adultery, steal, all that stuff. We'll, you know, but the Bible says it. It says it's good for you. It says the Sabbath is for man. It says, hey, I've done this thing as a favor for you to help your life be better. Like, do you do it? I'm not judging. I'm because it also says don't judge. I judge plenty. Not now though. This is a different thing. No. All right. I am forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues doing it. Not forgetting what they have heard. I love how he goes on. He says, but doing it. <laughs> how many times do you want to say doing it? Like, do you think he's trying to get something across, guys? 
You think you might have an agenda here, a, a point he's trying to communicate. James, just be clear with us, man. Doing it. Doing it. Doing what it says. Now, guys, listen to this. The, this is really what I want to say. And I know I'm having fun and, and that's like I think church should be fun. But what it says here is that, but doing it, not just reading, hearing, forgetting, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Now, that is not talking about you're going to have a good outcome. That is talking to New Testament believers who, because they're in Christ, have the blessing of God. So that blessed is actually talking about unlocking areas of blessing, which is this supernatural, just absolutely just divine force that God releases on his kids as a way of sh us shining and showing people what he's like. The ones who apply the word, we get to walk in this blessing. You are blessed, but you have a choice whether you walk in it or not. If you're in Christ, you're blessed. It said, the scripture says that if you're in Christ, you're an heir of Abraham and you're a recipient of the blessing. If you're filled with the Holy Spirit, it's impossible to be filled with the Holy Spirit without first receiving the blessing because you have to have the blessing to receive the Holy Spirit. So you can't tell me if you're a spirit-filled believer that you're not blessed because I can show you from scripture where you are. Whether you walk in it or not, that's up to you. And what we're dealing with here is how do we walk in it, particularly in the area of uh, of, our, of our giving and receiving. Deuteronomy chapter 28 says this. All these blessings will come on you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. Oh, that's legalism. I'm blessed already. Like, well, yeah, you've got food in the fridge, but you're not gonna, it doesn't do you any good unless you pull it out and eat it doesn't do you any good unless you pull it out, cook it, and eat it. Like, yeah, you're blessed. <laughs> but how do you pull, how do you, how do you, how do you, how do you change it from a, something that's in your account to something that's on your plate? By doing it. By doing it. All these blessings will come on you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. Now, that's not talking about you're going to be rewarded because you've been a good boy. It's not saying that. What it's saying is that God tells us what to do. We do it. It unlocks things in heaven. Heaven releases it to us on earth, and we have the blessing. We have what we've, whatever we've unlocked. It's not because you're a good boy. It's not because Jesus died for your sins. It's because you use the key that Jesus gave you, unlocked the thing, in he or you did the thing on earth, unlocked it in heaven, it came down, and now you've got the food in your plate out of the fridge. We're starting to see. There's a very clear. This is not legalism. This isn't. Uh, this isn't like you're getting a reward because you're good. You're, uh, the Bible says that you are the righteousness of God in Christ. You are. Literally, you want to talk about being a good boy? Jesus, however a good boy he was, is. You have been credited with that same righteousness. God looks at you. As just as with as much favor and as much love and as much perfection, fondness, you as he looks at God, as he looks at Jesus, it's a gift he's put on you. Like that's that, that is like there's no more, you could not be getting any more presents because you've been a good boy than you're already getting. Everything from here on is us turning keys that Jesus gave us to turn, amen. Right, so what I want us to look here, like, see, when we start to deal with, uh, you say, if you obey the Lord your God, the Lord will, uh, jump down to verse 11, it says, the Lord will grant you abundant prosperity. And then it goes on and itemizes different areas where this prosperity can be released. Oh, it's a prosperity gospel. Well, it's just, it's the gospel. And yes, you know what, some of it includes you being blessed. Sorry, hate to break it to you. If you don't like that. Maybe you can just give everything you get to the poor because I'm sure they would like it. Amen? All right. Now, I had a guy, he's a friend of his pastor, an absolute amazing man of God. So, uh, some of us here do know him and probably hold him in the same regard I do. He, a, a lot of 
the word of faith, things I understand and my understanding of uh, particularly to do with the supernatural healing and things like that. And it's, uh, he taught me. Amazing man of God. I won't say his name because I'm about to talk about disagreeing with him. Anyway, I was talking with his super, super rich guy. He, when he built his house, his house was house of the year. It was voted the best house that was built in Perth that year. Um, he, he's financially very, very successful. He is the only successful Christian, and by that I mean person who has fruit in their life, family, ministry, health, all of the things that you would mark as someone who you would look at and think, I, I would love to have a life like yours. The only person that I've ever known, there's two of them actually, that don't believe in the tithe. Both of their reasons for it is, well, I want, it, it limits your giving. <laughs> these guys give a massive amount. Like one of these guys, you go down the street where his church was, he paid for buildings that are on that street for the church that are now being used to feed the poor. Like, and that's his, <laughs> that was his rationale. I'm like, ah, uh, doesn't say you can't give more. And that was his reasoning for it. Anyway, so I was talking with this guy, and this is where I, uh, God just dropped it in my spirit as I was talking to him, because he's a much older and much more experienced than me. And I, it, that dynamic is, is uh, super respectful when I was with him. But I was like, well, you know, so it was actually a bit strange for me disagreeing with him, especially on a scriptural issue. And then, but God dropped something in my spirit where all of a sudden I remembered that in Ephesians 6, it says, the scripture says, honor your mother and your father which is the first commandment with a blessing. It's Ephesians, the Apostle Paul, the grace, the grace writer in the New Testament, the, probably the one who's got the best handle on it, the best communicator of grace. He's using an Old Testament command in the New Testament and showing how it still applies in the New Testament. Let me show you. The Old Testament says this, Deuteronomy 5, uh, honor your father and your mother, uh, as the Lord your God has commanded you so that you may live long and it may go well with you in the land the Lord your God is giving you. What it's saying here is you turn that key, it unlocks this thing. Turn this key here. This is your natural thing. The natural first, then the spiritual. You turn this key here, heaven responds. Sends down the natural outcome. The, and this is the out, natural outcome that you'll have a long, your life will be long and will go well with you. Then Paul is quoting the same passage in Ephesians. He's showing us that these commands that turn, these keys that worked then still work now. They're the same. That, they, they're not, the cross did not do away with these keys. All the cross did away with in the sense of the instructions in the Bible is we don't do them to earn righteousness. So if there's a particular scripture that talks about earning righteousness, like go sacrifice a goat, rub a bit of like blood from a bull on your ear and then your big toe says it seriously guys and that helps you be righteous you don't have to worry about that anymore you go like oh if you don't have money go get a pigeon like kill a pigeon <laughs> so it's just to understand that like certain things just because they're in the old testament doesn't mean that they're, they're not relevant and where it comes like <laughs> a, a good one is murder like the scripture you know it says don't murder right we can see murder was frowned upon before the law. The law came with Moses. So Moses was like 400 years after uh, Jacob. And Jacob was the grandson of Abraham. And Abraham was like the father of our faith, the one who actually was... But the thing was, he wasn't the first one to interact with God. There were people way before him, including Adam. Now, Adam, his, one of his kids killed one of his other kids. And do you know what? This is so far before the Ten Commandments were ever written now. It was frowned upon. Do you know who got upset? Not just the people, the guy that got killed, I expect, got really upset. God, God got upset. It's put in law hundreds of years later, probably thousands, 1,500 years later, where the, Is the nation of Israel was uh, this absolutely intermeshed system of political and religious, their law was, it was just, just one and the same, and thou shalt not kill came in there. My Bible says thou shalt not murder. The King James says thou shalt not kill. And I know all the King James fans are like, yeah, so much better than the other ones. This is the Bible Jesus read. 
King James people get really passionate about their King James. But that's more accurate because it doesn't say don't murder. And you know what? Jesus has died. Still not into us killing each other. You go kill someone now. The New Testament talks about God not liking it. Talks about it. It's not something we do. Before the law, under the law, after the law. Certain things still matter. David wanted to build the temple. God said, no, you can't build my temple because you were a warrior. He wasn't even an evil serial killer type killer. He was someone that's out killing, like protecting his country, doing like good things. One of my lecturers in Bible college was the, uh, the, the defense force chaplain for the whole of the defense force. And he was saying that these guys that have to kill people for their job, killing bad people for a good reason, he said it still actually affects them. Because it, 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 you're not, desi- not designed to do that. It's bad for you. It's not just bad for the person you kill. It's bad for you. So when we're seeing this transference across before the Old Testament, during the Old Testament, after the Old Testament, we're, we're starting to see there are things in play that God, that, that, that cross over. Now, one that no one likes to hear, not no one, because I think it's great, because the promise is fantastic. Who wouldn't want to hear this? Is, is that the tithe. People say, oh, the tithes are under the law. So, well, no, the tithe was before the law. These guys we spoke about, Abraham, Jacob, miles before the law was ever written, they were tithing. It was put into the requirements of the law because it's a good idea. After the law, Jesus had one thing to say about it, just do it. It, The case is still there. Let me just read it for you. I, the Lord, do not change, so you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Just a gentle little touch there. Thank you, Jesus, for not destroying us. Ever since the time of your ancestors have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them, return to me and I'll return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. It's talking about both. Tithes and offerings. Two things. You are under a curse, the whole nation, because you are robbing me. Now, you cannot be under a curse because Jesus became a curse for you. Because it's written, cursed is anyone that hung on a tree. You cannot be cursed. But again, it's like the food in the fridge. You actually have to apply that by faith. But that's not talking about this. You have a blood. You ought to, to not be cursed. You don't give. That's got nothing to do with it. It's you recognize that Jesus was cursed in your place for your sin before past, fu- uh, present and future. It's done. But God's still saying it's his. That doesn't change. Uh, because you rob- bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord. And see if I will not open, throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. You see the key there? His tithes and offerings, he, he stops talking about the offering and he starts talking about the tithe. Tithe literally means 10%. So when some people say, oh, I'm going to tithe 5%, you're like saying, I'm going to 10% 5%. I'm like, okay, that's not what it says, but you know. This is one of the keys that's, this is where we have the opportunity, guys, to, to have a distinction between us and the world. Because the world, can I tell you, they know this. You won't find a successful business that does not have a giving plan of at least 10% in their business structure. Like, it's a stock standard thing, at least give 10% to whatever charity that, you know, help the poor, help people. Like, that's a stock standard thing in businesses. It's not because they're generous. It's because they know that it unlocks something. It's, they call it the uh, reciprocity. It, it's a, a thing. They recognize it. It's actually a documented thing. These guys, it's a biz, part of the business plan. Like, it's a thing. But here, we can see something where the distinction comes in. Bring the whole tithe. doesn't say use the whole 10% to help the different things that you choose. 
into the storehouse. It, see, here it tells us, bring it into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. It's talking about the temple. The New Testament application is the church. That there may be food in my house. It's talking about that we can actually resource the people that work there. That we can have an operate so it will function. And this is where it goes from just something that helps and blesses you to supercharge. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. That is the distinction between using that 10% that you do not want to keep. I promise you, you don't want that. These, these businesses know they don't want that, that it is not good for you to hang on to that. They get that. And they will, they will use it in their own foundations and they will apply it however they choose. Here we see that God has a, a, a key for you and me. What we do with that 10% is releasing, opening the floodgates of heaven, having pouring out so much blessing you won't have room enough for it. It's talking about another level being released to you. The scripture we've been working from is that is uh, Proverbs 11.24 from the message. We're saying the world of the generous gets larger and larger. The world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. God cares about how you give. He's looking at, at your giving. You know, it says that there's a story in the Bible where it's like some little old lady. I'm assuming she's old. I don't know why. It doesn't even say she's old. It just says she's a widow. She might be a young widow. She comes and gives two cents essentially two cents do you remember cents two of them and jesus was, it says he was sitting there watching people put their money in i'm like wow what are you doing jesus like god's watches he it matters to him the scripture says that in, in uh in is it matthew's gospel luke's, luke's gospel uh 16 10 it says he who is faithful with what is least is faithful also in much and he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much god is saying money because it's talking about the context of that is money is literally the least in the kingdom do you know it, the bible says that in heaven he uses it for bitumen gold he uses it for bitumen he's like guys get your priorities straight this is such a tiny thing for me like but he knows for us it's, it's the most important. He's watching it. And I want you to, I want to see this one thing here. Second Corinthians chapter 8 verse 7 says this. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the, lo uh, in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. So this isn't now we're moved away from a tithe. We're talking about the offering. I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. God is saying here, guys, you don't have to do this. You don't have to. But then he's like, I'm watching though to see if you will and how you do it. You know that word test? Am I going to butcher this, Daniel? A metallurgist. Is that what you do for a job? Metallurgist? Close enough. It's like someone who expect, inspects metal, checks it out and looks at it. That, that's what the test is here. So God's saying, hey, you don't have to do this, guys. But I'd like you to. And, and this is a test. This is not saying you're in or out. It's just I get to see what's really in you. I get to see what you're really made of. Do you know that Jesus gets to look at your use of money? It says if you're faithful with the least, you can see the future. You're faithful with little now. You're, un you're, 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 you're going to be trustworthy with more. I, I can tell the future. If you're not with it now, you're one of those people, oh, when I hit it rich, I'll tithe. You know, we had people, I remember one guy's like, oh, Jacob, help me pick my lotto numbers because when I win the lotto, I'm going give to give 10% to the church. I'm like, oh, no, you won't. How do I know? Because you don't do it now. You can see the future. Another place that says that where your money is, there your heart will be not where your heart is where it will be it's talking about your future god can see your future
carrying on from that verse in, in, in Luke um, 16. So if you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? God wants us as a church to be safe hands for true riches. He wants us as a church to be somewhere that the broken can come in and they will be treated in a way that represents him. He wants this church to be a place that are the hands and feet of Jesus, accurately representing his hands, his feet, and his voice. This is what he's calling us to as a church. He's saying, guys, I want to release true riches to you. That's his, that's his heart for the church. But here he's saying, if you're not being faithful with the little stuff, the least, and, and specifically talking about our income or our resources, our money, to use the M word, he's like, I can't do that. So for us, I want us to see as we're heading into our building fund, let's not, and, I, and I'm not trying to pressure anyone into doing anything, but I do want us to be hearing from God. I do want us to be obedient to what God's saying to us. And I just know that if God has our money, He has our heart. And if He has our heart, life is different. Life is different. God has my heart. And my brothers saw it. And they came to God because they saw what God did with me after I gave him my heart. I want us to bow our heads. Before I, 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 I want to pray and seal this word, but before I do that, I, I need to speak to people who have never given God their heart never made that decision to follow Christ. If that's you and you've, you're here today and you've never made that decision, we're going to say a prayer as a church all together. But I'm asking if you will pray it and mean it with all your heart. If you're online and that's you, pray it out loud with us and mean it with all your heart. Repeat after me, church. Dear God, today I choose to follow you. Have my heart. Wash it clean. Help me to walk every day with you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I'm going to pray. and just I believe that that word was ministering to people and speaking to people, and I, I'm sure it was challenging people. Lord, we know that your plan for our life is good, that when you call us to do things, you're never ripping us off. It's impossible to be ripped off by you. Lord, I pray that we would be men and women who don't serve money, but we let money serve us. And then in, the, in that means we, it serves you because we serve you. Lord, I know you've got people here in every single different stages of life and ups and downs of it all. And some people here are better struggling financially. Lord, that those people you would meet in a radical way your supernatural provision would come. I'm just even just right now, just seeing bills are being paid. Even like right now, some people are going to be, uh, there's bills that you thought you could never pay and that you're going to get advice that they've been paid, they've been cancelled, they've been forgiven. Some people, are, the circumstances are so much more complex. And Lord, that you would meet them there, Lord God, in their businesses and their ministries and their, uh, their works, Lord God. But God, more than any of that, you want our hearts. And I pray, God, that, this, that we would be a people we would be a people, God, who you have our money. That you have it. We understand that it's all yours. And we know that where our money is, there our heart will be also, God. And you have our heart. You have all of us. God, I thank you that you're safe hands for your kids. You don't rip your children off. You're a generous provider for your children. You, you like to use your children to show how amazing you are, how kind 